another thing or two about the Imam. At the end of the day, who is this? The, father, the grandfather of Al Imam Al Hujjah. Isn't he the Imam of our time? Let's say that the Imam is to return and he is amongst us. May Allah hasten his reappearance. And he asks you, O oh Mu'min, O oh believer, of follower of Ahlul Bayt, tell me a thing or two about my grandfather, Al Imam Al Hadi. What did he contribute to society? Oh, I don't know much. Tad Imam of Ahlul Bayt, that's pretty much all I know. Or some brothers may actually even say, I just know he was an Imam. By giving justice to the Imam of our time, let's learn a thing or two about this great man, the guide for the Muslim Ummah at his time and after his time, after his martyrdom. Because Al Imam Al Hadi alayhi salam was oppressed in his life and after his life. How so? In his life, very much oppressed. He had to deal through several establishments. Al Mu'tasim, and then Al Musta'in, Al Mutawakkil, Al Mu'taz, Al Wathiq, Al Muntasir. All of these khulafa he went through. Each one has their own approach, correct or no? So in his life, he was oppressed. But how after his life? 2006, his haram was blown up. His haram and Al Imam Al Askari by self proclaimed Muslims, extremists. These individuals came and they had the audacity to destroy the sanctuary of Al Imam Al Hadi alayhi salam, oppressed in his life and after his life. Moreover, oppressed because his own followers perhaps don't know a thing or two about him. Therefore, by showing our passion and love to Imam Zaman and to that Imam that had it not been for him, the guide, Islam would have ceased to exist. Let's show our love to the Imam by learning a thing or two about the Imam alayhi salam. As we mentioned, his title is Al-Hadi. There is a point in the Imam's life, indeed, where that is manifested. We'll get to that point, inshallah. But the titles of the Imams are unique in that they are par Indeed, Al-Imam the truthful one. But that doesn't mean that Imam al-Qadr is not Sadiq. Of course he has a Sadiq. Kulluhum, all of them are Sadiq. Umara al mumini They are all Shuhada. They are all Kadhim, patient. They are all Rida. They are all satisfied. They are all guides. Al-Hadi, indeed. But their title manifested in their life. Therefore, synchronizing it at a particular event. In which, had it not been for that event, as we mentioned, what would have happened? Islam would have ceased to exist. So let's begin analyzing just a glimpse from the scene of Al Hadi. The Medina of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, to Al Imam al Jawad and his mother, so, uh, books of history will call her Sumana al Maghrabiya. In that is our first lesson. That the Imams of Ahlul Bayt don't look for only like hot and like Arab. No. If a person is a good believer and a good woman, they're looking for them as a potential partner in life. Even if they are bad, Muslim, or to Al Madina. It doesn't matter. A bad, poor, and pious person is someone you'd want to be with more than someone from your own village. That's our first lesson right there. He, alayhi salam, was raised in that beloved house. By the way, the Imam was born, they say, in the 212th year after Hijrah. The reign of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt publicly lasted throughout 250 years. We have another khatib, mashallah. The reign of the Imams lasted 250 years, beginning with Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam up until Sahib al Zaman, Ajrullah ta'ala farajah al Sharif's, Ghaybat al Sukhra. Al Imam al Hadi was born, as we mentioned, in the 212th year after Hijrah. Up until the Imam was about eight years of age, his father, Al-Imam Al-Jawad, was martyred by his own wife. So they call her Umm Al-Fadl or Umm Fadl. Where do we see this happening in the lives of the Imam? With Al-Imam Al-Hassan. His wife, Ju'da bint Al-Ash'ath, poisoned the Imam. Likewise, Al-Imam Al-Jawad was poisoned by his wife. Unfortunately, there are those who even if they are close to you, they may be the biggest enemy to you. And this was a test by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find the Imam, when he became eight years old and his father was martyred, 
he assumes the imamate. Now, <clears throat> many people had difficulty or went through difficulty accepting the fact that an eight-year-old can become an imam. It's difficult to accept that this entire Muslim ummah is now under the guidance of an eight-year-old kid. When in reality, we find this happening many times in the past before. And this is one of the three reasons as to why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam wasn't granted the khilafa by the bunch of Sahaba at the time. Number one, it was because of his age. Imam Ali alayhi salam, what year was he born in? 680. Rasulullah, what year? 571. These dates, let's try to memorize them. So we give justice to the greatest household in existence. 571 years after Christ, Rasulullah Muhammad was born His bi'tha, the commencement of the message of Islam and the mission of Islam began in which year? 611, making how old? Rasulullah, 40 years old. Amir al-Mu'mineen, how old? About 11 years of age. Amir al-Mu'mineen, throughout the time of Islam, when Rasulullah was alive, until Rasulullah was taken away from this earth, how old was he when Rasulullah passed away? 33 of age. The Sahaba were all in their 60s, 70s, they were old, they were aristocrats, big names. They couldn't accept a young man whose beard didn't even have the slightest white hair in it to become the Khalifa, Hujjatullah ala al-Arf, on top of their heads. It was hard to accept. Age played a pivotal role at that moment. That was one of the reasons. A second reason was due to jealousy. Many of his people got sick hearing Rasulullah praise Imam Ali day in and out. They were sick of it. Ali yun minni wa ana min Ali. Ali ma'al haq wal haq ma'a Ali. Ali ana madinatul ilmi wa Ali yun babaha. Faman arad al madinati wal yatiha min babaha. Ali is to me like Harun was to Musa. Illa an la. Nabiya min ba'di. Ali was deserving of Fatima to Zahra. Ali, Ali, Ali. Salamullahi ala. Too much praise. The Sahaba, some of them got jealous indeed. And so it was difficult accepting that. Jealousy was alive. The, sec the third point and claim as to why he wasn't given that khilafah instantly was due to the hatred. Because there was not one household at the time that had a couple of family members that were killed by Amir al-Mu'mineen. Well, it's not his fault your household family members became kuffar and mushrikeen and decided to fight God's final message. There was envy when Amir al-Mu'mineen returned back with Rasulullah in Fatih Mecca in the eighth year after Hijrah. Rasulullah approached all of these big names that waged war against him in Badr, Uhud, and Khandaq. People of the likes such as uh, Sufya, uh, um, uh, Sufyan, and uh, Abba Sufyan and the aristocrats at that time, they were afraid, hemmed amongst them too, killed and cannibalized the uncle of the Holy Prophet. And these people, they waged war, Imam Ali killed several from them, and they were thinking that they're going to be killed now, and Rasulullah will seek vengeance. And then he recites the following lines, قَالَ لَا تَثْرِيبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْيَوْمِ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ فَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ There will be no punishment upon you today. Allah will forgive you for you is the most forgiving. Amir al-Mu'mineen waged, fought these people, and now they entered Islam. They were known as the Tulaqa, the excommunicated ones in that sense, the Tulaqa. They entered Islam because their hearts not, weren't necessarily inclined to Islam, but they had no other choice. Ba'd Rasulullah took over Mecca, so they had no choice but to accept Islam. That hatred still burned in their hearts. So when Amir al-Mu'mineen was meant to assume the Khilafah, hatred got in the way. But the point being, we notice that age played a factor. And now imagine, if people cannot handle a 33-year-old becoming Khalifa, could, do you think they could handle an 8-year-old becoming Khalifa? No, it was difficult. So the lesson behind the age of the Imam lies with two areas. Number one, a filter system. Who will accept, who will not accept? Will you? Because you definitely know the haqq. O muwali, O follower of Ahlul Bayt, still accept the fact that this is your Imam? If so, then good on you, you're on the right path. If not, we filtered the wrong from the right. That was one. Two, to prove a point, that our youth, if they excel in disciplines, then let them be the lead of that discipline, youth program, youth initiatives. Don't be dumbfounded when you see a youth, but an eight-year-old, acting like a 28-year-old. 
but the opposite is also true. A 28-year-old will act like an 8-year-old sometimes. But the point is that our youth, don't neglect them, push them to the side like that. Maybe they are bright. In fact, no, all of them are bright. Maybe they'll excel in certain disciplines, which is why you find when the Imam was received the news that his father passed away, he prayed on him. He led the janazah, the tashi'ah, he prayed upon his father, Imam al-Jawad, and news reached the establishment in Baghdad. Who was the Khalifa? Al-Mu'tasim al-Abbasi. Al-Mu'tasim knew. See, these people, they hate Ahlul Bayt, but they know they're right. He knew that this one was the next. What did he decide to do? He wasn't going to kill him. He's an eight-year-old boy. It would look very bad. He decides to brainwash him, or at least attempt to brainwash the Imam. Al-Mu'tasim al-Abbasi, sitting on his throne in Baghdad, lofty, lavish, luxurious, decides to send the most knowledgeable man in Arabic grammar, in Quranic exegesis, and in Islamic theology. But he was not a Shi'i. His name was Ubaidullah al-Junaydi. He was a scholar, not from the school of Ahlul Bayt, but the most knowledgeable in his field at that time. He sends him to Al-Madina, and he says, I want you to tutor this young boy. Make sure you, obviously the idea was to plant Al-Mu'tasim's agenda in the brain of the Imam. So that, you know, because before him we saw Imam Al-Jawad, he was also under the age of 10 and he became Imam. And look at what he was able to achieve. Change his mind before it's too late. So he sends this man, Ubaidullah Junaidi, to go and tutor the Imam. And he begins teaching the Imam. They have sessions and classes. Time passes by, Al-Mu'tasim asks for this Ubaidullah al Junaidi, he says, How is that young boy that you're teaching? How is he doing? A Junaidi is like, Which young boy? He's like, You know, you know, that young man, Ibn al Rada, the son of Al Rada. Al Imam al Hadi is not the son of Al Imam al Rada, he's the son of who? Al Imam al Jawad. But the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that came post Imam al Rada were all titled Ibn al Rada, the son of Al Rada. Why? Because Al-Imam al-Rada achieved a status in the political sphere that had his name well known across the world. Which is a lesson for all of us today. That if you are not satisfied with the affairs, with the laws, with the statements that are being proclaimed, especially if you're from America, by the establishment, by the government, talking about you and your people, then run for office, be involved in the affairs of your municipality. MashaAllah, Brother Muhammad Hamoud over here made this wonderful announcement and that he is going to take on that role. We should see this more often. Muslim activism is of the utmost importance. You want change? Be the change. Don't just sit there and wait. Ya haram, they did this to us. Ya haram, they said this about Muslims. Oh, change it. Sooner or later, you're gonna have hijab bans, Sharia law bans, Alabama in America. Sharia law is banned. Why Sharia Allah banned? Because we don't want stoning, as if stoning is a problem in America. They don't, ignorance. Next thing you know, they're going to ban the month of Ramadan, they're going to ban halal food. Be the change in society and make this effort, which is why we commend our dear brother, mashallah, for taking that first step. And we need to endorse all of our Muslim brothers and sisters that are going into this political sphere because you find that lesson with Imam al rada by virtue of him having that position. Of course, he was forced to. It's not like he had any other choice, but now his voice was able to be projected worldwide. And so every time a child from the progeny of Imam al rada was referred to, they would call him Yabn al rida oh, the son of al rida so Al-Mu'tasim says to Ubaidullah Junaidi, you're that little boy, how is he doing? Which one? Ibn al-Rada. He's like, don't call him little boy. You mean a shaykh Ali al-Hadi? Like, what do you mean shaykh? A shaykh has two meanings. One, elder. Two, scholar, alim, deen. He's like, no, don't call him young boy, call him shaykh. He's like, why? He says, you think when I go to teach him that I'm teaching him stuff? But Allah, he's teaching me. Eight years old, memorize all the Qur'an. How? Eight years old. And that's not just it. I would tell him to recite the Qur'an. He would say, no, 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 don't tell me to recite. You recite and I'll continue it. Pick any random area and I'll continue it. And not just that. He will tell me when the verse was revealed. Why it was revealed. And to whom was it revealed for? This young man, who is teaching him? His father's not around. 
They don't understand that their ilm comes straight from Rabbul Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, and this man, Ubaidullah Junaidi, became a Shi'i and a Muwali for the Ahlul Bayt. Subhanallah, a tutor can have that effect. In reality, who was, being, who was the tutor here? Al Imam Al Hadi was tutoring Ubaidullah Junaidi, the biggest alim of his time. But you find there is no shame, brothers and sisters. And this is another lesson. See, the life of the Imams, they're all lessons. They're all principles for all of us to implement in our lives today. You want lessons? Don't look further than Ahlul Bayt. They'll take you to Allah and back. You find, no, actually, they'll take you to Allah and they'll keep you by Allah. They won't bring you back. You find that the tutor is of the utmost importance. This man, he thought he was teaching Imam. Imam taught him. He became a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. There's another example in history years before. Muawiyah. Son of Yazid, son of Muawiyah, son of Abu Sufyan, son of Harb. Yazid ibn Muawiyah had a son by the name of Muawiyah. He named him after his father. This Muawiyah, Yazid instructed, if you were from a very luxurious family, very rich family, you had the privilege of making sure that your children were tutored by teachers, by professionals, but not in any specific field, in an array of fields. They would tutor you in three areas. Number one, in grammar, teach you Arabic, reading and writing. Number two, in Quran. And number three, in general sciences, astrology, astrophysics, mathematics, geography, chemistry. They will tutor in these fields. Yazid, he had a son named Muawiyah. Muawiyah, Yazid gave him a tutor just to teach him general knowledge. Two Yazids, not information, his tutor that he instructed happened to be a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. His name was Umar bin Maqsus, and he followed the Ahlul Bayt. Yazid didn't know that. This Muawiyah grew up following the Ahlul Bayt. When Yazid died in the 63rd year after Hijrah, the dynasty works like this, father, son, father, son, father, son, the Khilafah goes like that. His older son Muawiyah was supposed to assume the Khilafah. And so he was a follower of the Ahlul Bayt because of his teacher and how it affected him. When he was approached by the people, you are not the Khalifa, you are not Hujatullah, he did a very interesting thing by going up on the member in Medina, the member of Rasulullah, the pulpit, and he made an interesting announcement. He would say, Ayyuhan Nas, O people, I am not the Khalifa on earth, no way. This, this Khilafa, this Caliphate, deserves to go to Ali, son of Imam Hussein. May Allah, and look how he concludes, curse my father and my grandfather. Moments later, they assassinated him. But look at that. You would think a child from this disgusting progeny, Muawiyah, son of, the father of Yazid, the son of Hind, the son of Abu Sufyan. Do you think you can find anybody who would be God-fearing and pious? No, but because of a tutor, made him go through a 180 and actually stood up on the pulpit and said, I don't deserve the Khilafah. It belongs to Ali Zainul Abideen. And may Allah curse my father and my grandfather. Wow. The effect of a tutor. And you find that Imam Ali al Hadi tutored this Ubaidullah Junaidi, making him a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. Alayhum as -salam. When the Imam became of age and, beca and began teaching in the mosque of Rasulullah, he was teaching lessons that were preserved in what is known as Sahifat Ali, the compilation of Imam Ali salam. What is Sahifat Ali? We hear Sahifat Sajjadiyah. Sahifat Ali is what? Amir al-Mu'mineen would take notes whenever Rasulullah would lecture. You see a professor, when he lectures, you take notes normally, well, you better if you want to pass. When he would take these notes, they were passed down through every Imam. Imam al-Hadi had it. And then he would teach these lessons and these wonderful collection of wisdom to the masses, to the people. Up until the Imam was around 21 years old, the establishment at that time, who was in charge? A man by the name of Al-Mutawakkil Al-Abbasi. If you ever want to see a hater for the Ahlul Bayt, by all means, don't look any further than Al-Mutawakkil Al-Abbasi. 47 times he tried destroying the grave of Imam al Hussein. He tried to divert the Furat, Samaht al Sheikh mentioned, over the grave of Aba Abdullah so that it would wash away. 
When he dug, when he sent his men to dig and divert the Furat River across and make sure it reaches across the grave of Imam Hussein so it could be forgotten in history, the water, by Allah's will and grace, diverted naturally around the grave. It would not go over the grave. And that is why today it was called Al Ha'ir, the confused. It was puzzled. The water is puzzled. That's why those who live in Karbala, you might find them, their last name, Al Ha'iri, mashallah. The, com com the confused in that sense, because the water was confused. Why am I not going over? Why am I doing unnatural things? Because of the shrine of Abu Abdullah at that one point. Al Mutawakkid tried his hardest to remove that name, to remove the sanctity of Imam Al Hussein, but he kept failing so much, and he tried to ban the pilgrimage to Abu Abdullah. So if you wanted to go, you had to pay a price. What kind of a price? Five dollars? Ten dollars? Your arm. You, feel, you lost an arm, you want to come back next year? You lose your second arm. You have no more arms? You can go for free? You lose your leg. No more legs? That's it. Can you go for free now? You lose your eyes. No more uh, Look at the lovers of Imam Hussein. Look at that, look at that. Be thankful that we could go now, alhamdulillah. And many of us, this isn't new to us. Some of us may remember during the horrible establishment of about 20 years ago in Iraq, the Mashaya was banned. No one could walk. For those who know, no, they could recall that. Now be grateful that you have an Imam available for you to visit. Look what they had to go through at one point. You lose your feet and your arms and your eyes until they would just give up and off with your head. This al mutawakkil was angry, was fueled with hatred to the Ahlul Bayt. A man by the name of Nusr bin Ali, he narrated a narration. He would say, Qala Rasulullah, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Man ahabbani wa ahabba hadhain Whoever loves me and who loves these two Referring to Al-Hasani wa Al-Husayn And their father Wa man ahabba ummahuma And their mother Kana ma'i fil jannah Will be with me in heaven rugged area known as Khan al-Sa'ali, that really bad, poor, impoverished area where the homes and the uh, living standards were very low. The homeless would live there, the criminals would live there. He made the Imam stay there. After some time, he moved into Samarra, after the capital was moved to Samarra. And you find the Imam would live under house arrest. Just so we know what our Imam went through. And so that when Sahab al Zaman, as we mentioned earlier, is amongst us today, we can say, Ya Mahdi, I know a thing or two about your holy grandfather and the sacrifice that he put forth for man and womankind in order to preserve this wonderful message known as Islam, Ahlul Bayt. He would go through house arrest and spend his time there. He would never leave the home except he was accompanied with guards, if he was going to go shop in the market, guards were with him, if he needed to visit the sick, guards were with him, if he needed to go elsewhere, he was always followed and tracked with guards, limited, confined, to the point in which al mutawakkil decided to send a man by the name of Sa'id to the house of Imam al-Hadi, break inside the house and see what he is doing, and if you want, go ahead, take what you like. So this Sa'id breaks into the house of Imam al-Hadi in the middle of the night while the Imam was sleeping. And so he breaks in and it's dark. He can't see with the dark. So he's not making his way properly. He hears a noise. Sa'id, wait, here's a candle. And Imam al-Hadi said, here, you want to steal something? At least be able to see what you're going to steal. Look at that. Look at that demeanor the Imam had right there. Okay, he's coming to steal from you. Here, here's a candle. Make your way. Take whatever you want. The Imam, he had not much to offer anyways. He had a rug, his Qur'an, and the mattress. A jug, a collection of books perhaps. And that's pretty much it. 
This Sa'id returned back to Al-Mutawakkil and he said, you know, he has, doesn't have much. It's pretty much nothing. A day goes by, the mother of Al-Mutawakkil comes and visits an Imam Al-Hadi. She says, Assalamu alaykum ya Amir al -Mu'mineen. My son Al-Mutawakkil, notice that tyrant, tyrannical ruler Al-Mutawakkil, his mom is visiting Imam Hadi. My son Al-Mutawakkil fell ill, he's sick, and we want your advice. I know he's been very hard on you, I'm so sorry, but that's how he is. Do you have any advice? So the Imam would instruct what that Al-Mutawakkil should eat in order to feel better. This mother of Al-Mutawakkil gave an Imam Al-Hadi money, approximately 10,000 dinar. When she walked out of the house of Al Imam Al Hadi, the guards noticed they saw Mutawakkil's mom coming out from the house. Immediately they ran to Al Mutawakkil. Mutawakkil, Ali Al Hadi has her mother just, we saw her walk out from the home. He ran on Mutawakkil himself. He got the Imam and made sure that the Imam approached him in his court. And he said, What was this? What's this 10,000? He says, well, I mean, your mom came and she said you were sick and it's because of me, you're now better. And she, this 10,000 is from her as a gift. Mutawakkil fell down in shame. He says, okay, I'm sorry, you can go back to your home. Do you know they would do this to the imam every single day? Wake up, come, let's go. And Mutawakkil wants to see you. Be thankful you can get an hours of sleep. Look what the imam has to deal with. A drunkard, wretched, oppressor ruler like this every single day. But he would still be a guide for all the people. His Shia would barely see him, but they could catch him as the Imam was leaving from the home to, let's say, the market and return back home. A quick question would come by. But time went by, the sanctions would become heavier on the Imam, and he was not allowed to leave at one point. And so the system of networking was established. A network in which the Shia would remain in contact and communicate with one another through letters and notes. So the Imam would distribute representatives in Baghdad, in Qom, in back in Medina, and the Shia there would write to the Imam. Many of our Masail, jurisprudence, fiqhiyya, our jurisprudential laws and rulings, come from Al Imam Al Hadi. And the most meticulous rulings come from Al Imam Al Hadi. Meticulous. Do you know what meticulous means? Meaning very detailed questions. Because we have their answer today, we should be thankful. Where do they come from? Al Imam Al Hadi. One of the questions would come by, Oh Imam, can we do sujood on glass? Think about it, glass. Could we do sujood on that and pray? Because the idea is we cannot do sujood on something we can wear or eat. How about glass? The Imam would say no, because glass is made and combined with sand and salt. Therefore, it is not necessarily organic. Therefore, you can't. How would we know this? Had the Imam not given us an answer? They would come and ask the Imam all of these little questions. The belt that a Muslim wears, if it was slaughtered from a non-halal animal, but in a halal country, is it allowed to wear? Is it not najis? These questions the Imam would ask. So because of these wonderful hundreds of questions the Imam answered, our lives are much more easier today. Just so we know a thing or two about the Imam al-Hadi and all he gave to us. These masail, these answers, the way he eased our life. There was an event in which Al-Mutawakkil was approached by a lady. And she said, Oh Al-Mutawakkil, I am a Sayyida Zainab. Mutawakkil was, wait, what? Say, which Sayyida Zainab? Sayyida Zainab, daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You mean Sayyida Zainab, the one in Karbala? He's like, yes. Mutawakkil was like, you know, I, I do drink, but I'm not. Which Sayyida Zainab? Daughter of Ali, yes. He was confused, he had a headache. He said, you know what, just give me, give me, give me Ali al-Hadi, give me Ali. Ali al-Hadi comes and they wake him up in the middle of the night. They make sure it's in the night, not in the day, so they can bother the Imam. They bring him, come. They see, they bring him and he's in the court. And Mutawakkil is like, this lady, what, destroying my brain right now. She says she's a Sayyidah Zainab. What do you say? Imam al-Hadi looks at him, you mean you're meant to be my auntie Zainab? The sister of my great grandfather, Abu Abdullah, she said, Yes, I'm a Sayyidah Zainab. How are you still alive? She would say, I have a dream that Rasulullah would touch me, and whenever he touches me, my youth would return, and that's how I live every single night. He said, Okay, okay, mashallah. Mutawakkil, do you still have your lions in the cage? He said, Oh no, what's going on now? Lions in the cage, what are you doing? Because the children of Amir al Mu'mineen, no wild animal would dare touch them. 
They know their rights. Animals know their rights and humans don't sometimes. He's like, yeah, if you're truly a Sayyidah Zainab, the wild lions would not dare touch you. She flipped it on Imam al-Hadi. Well, yeah, if you're truly the grandson of Rasulullah, you go inside the cage. The Imam said, well, okay, mutawakkil, allow me to enter the cage of your lions. They say these were lions that were not fed for three days. You know a lion that's not fed for three days? The first thing it, it sees moves it wants to kill, he goes inside the cage and the hadith says this detail that the lions came to an imam and they all sat beside him, not moving. And he said, well, now you enter. He's like, no, 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 I'm no longer Sayyidah Zainab anymore. And Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam displayed absolute truthful guidance. Truthful in the sense that his guidance was only sincere. His greatest enemy and adversary, he would still guide as he would heal him whenever he was ill, whenever his mother would approach for questions and inquiries. Yet this Imam was so oppressed, my dear respected brothers and sisters. One night, and we will conclude very soon, inshallah. One night, and Mutawakkil was holding a palace house party. In these parties, see when a king holds a party, thousands of people show up, not hundreds, thousands come up. And he was drunk. Drinking, see they call him Muhyi Sunnah, drunk. MashaAllah, Hush Sunnah. He is sitting on that pulpit and he's drinking and he calls Imam al-Hadi, come, come, sit next to me. And he looks at him and he says, drink. Imam al-Hadi says, ma khalata lahmi wa dami. My flesh and blood will never be mixed with that. He's like, okay, you're not going to drink? Look at the audacity, dance. Dance, Imam al-Hadi says, no. He says, no, it's not gonna, okay, fine. Sing, Imam al-Hadi says, no, fine. Recite poetry. The Imam said, no, I am not from the poets. He says, I am not from Ahlu Shi'ar. I'm not from the poets, the family of the poets. Now, to our understanding, the Ahlul Ahl Bayt are very poetic. The Quran is poetic. The Quran is very po poetic, it has a melody, it rhymes. How is it that the Imam says he is not from those of the poets? He's trying to prove a point, clearly. That look, even if you're ordered to do something that's not haram, just because it's not haram, doesn't always make it okay. My words, watch them carefully. Just because it's not haram, doesn't mean it's okay. Because the man that ordered him to read poetry was a drunk. Are you going to take orders from a drunk? But he just told me to do something that's not haram. No, no, it doesn't matter. Who was the one who told you? There's a lesson there. Just because it's not forbidden, does not make it okay all the time. Until he was forced, al mutawakkil looks at him and says, La bud, you have to, you have to, whether you like it or not. Now the Imam is compelled. The Imam السلام, blows his mind with this wonderful, bone chilling piece of poetry. This poem, my dear respected brothers and sisters, Poetry and dua are different. A dua is a conversation between you and Allah. Poetry is about perhaps this dunya, let's say. But when it's about Allah, it becomes dua. Rarely you see the Ahlul Bayt reciting just poetry, relating, pertaining to just dunya. But now he is forced to. So the Imam will use a method to indirectly insult Al Mutawakkil without using his name. Listen to the lines of Al Imam Al Hadi. He would say, Batu ala qulalil ajbali tahrusuhum Wulbur rijali falam tanfa'um wul qulalu Wustan zalu ba'dazin min ma'aqinihim Wuskinu hufaran ya bi'sama nazalu Nadahum sarikun min ba'di dafnihim Ayna al-asratu wal-tijalu wal-hulalu Ayna al-wujuhu allati kanat muna'amatan Min duniha tudrabu al-astaru wal-kilalu فأفصح القبر عنهم حين سألهم تلك الوجوه عليها الدود يقتتل قد طالما أكلوا دهرا وقد شربوا وأصبحوا اليوم بعد الأكل
Qadukinu. He would recite the line, they spend their nights on the peaks of mountains, thinking they are fortified, surrounded by great elite men, that will not help them. Their luxury and palace will all crumble at one point. Where are the crowns? Where is the lavishness? Where are the gems? Where are the faces that you would never show to people because of the status that you had in society? You would never succumb to show that face, that soft face, the bugs are now eating it in the grave, O oh, Al-Mutawakkil. Look at how the Imam doesn't use his name, but still destroys his heart. Al-Mutawakkil, by the time the Imam finished reciting this poem, was crying. And he was holding his glass of wine. He instantly dropped it. He was in shock. He couldn't handle this anymore. And he sent the Imam away. And then Imam, alayhi salam, Time went on. Al-Mutawakkil was killed by his son, Al-Muntasir. Al-Muntasir died shortly after that, six months. Then came Al-Musta'in. During that reign, Al-Imam Al-Hadi had some freedom. After which, Al-Mu'taz came into power. He came into power, my dear brothers and sisters. Al-Mu'taz was the caliph that killed Al-Imam Al-Hadi remembering the tribulation that the Imam went through. At around 41 years old, the Imam السلام, was poisoned. Al-Mu'taz sent a man to go poison the food of our beloved Imam. And you find that Imam Al-Hadi would be sitting on his bed. Next to him, Al-Imam Hassan Al-Askari. And he would tell him three things. He would say, my beloved son, I ask from you three things. He would say, my beloved father, what is it? And Imam Al-Hadi would say to that young Imam Hassan Al-Askari, number one, my beloved child, you are the Imam after me. You are the Imam when I leave this world. The Imam is going through so much pain as he is speaking. He would say, my beloved father, what is the next will that you want me to fulfill? And the Imam says, bury me in my home. I do not wish to be buried outside of my house. When you go to Samarra, inshallah, the haram is the house of Imam Al-Hadi. Make sure you keep that in mind when you pay a visit to him. Then Imam Hassan Al-Azkari says, My beloved father, what is the third will that you request? Imam Al-Hadi said, Do not forget the grave of Abba Abdullah. That grave in Karbala, never make, make sure it is never alone. Pay your visits to it, Ya Bunay. It's as if an Imam Al-Hadi recognizes that I am sitting next to my beloved son in my final moments. Who sat next to Imam al Hussein in his final moments? Oh, Imam Al-Hadi, you are sitting next to Al-Askari. Where were the children of Imam Hussein? Al-Azghar had the arrow on his neck. Ali Al-Akbar had the spear in his chest. Where are the sons to comfort their father on the last moment? Where is the children to be by the father? Al Imam al Askari says, I began to cry at that moment. Al Imam al Hadi would say, Do not cry, my beloved son, for you will be the father of the awaited Savior. Hujjatullahi ala khalqeh. Al Imam al Mahdi. Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Al Imam al Hadi's love in our hearts raising our arms raise the arms brothers and sisters it is said that when you recite a dua Allah will notice the arms that are risen because not only did you express the dua with your tongue you also expressed it with your hands we say with our hands risen ya Allah we will never forget the ziyara of al imam al hussein and the love for imam al hussein by reciting three times hussein ya Hussein ya Hussein ya Hussein Allahumma inna nas'aluka wa nad'uk bi ismika al-'adhim al-a'zham 
Ten times, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. With the love of Imam Al Hadi, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ilahi bi Fatima wa Abiha. وبعلها وبنيها شاف مرضانا اقضي حوائجنا فرج عنا اقضي ديننا إلهي بالهادي ارزقنا زيارة الحسين في الدنيا وشفاعته في الآخرة اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن